Support for this broadcast of Two Rivers 30 Minutes comes in part from a grant from Striffler's Family Funeral Homes. From TubeCityOnline.com, this is Two Rivers 30 Minutes, a weekly series of interviews with people making news around the McKeesport area. Produced by Tube City Community Media Incorporated, a nonprofit corporation. I'm Jason Toger, the executive director. On this show, we talk one on one with elected officials, community leaders, and others who are trying to make a difference in the Monyonk area. And we also take your questions and comments on Facebook and Twitter at Tube City Online. How do you sort the fact from the fiction, whether that is from the traditional media or that is from your social media feed? How do you sort the rumor that, well, sometimes the rumors on Facebook are no better sourced, it seems, than some of the rumors maybe we are getting from the White House. Our guest this morning is Zach Furness. He is Associate Professor of Communications at uh, Penn State Greater Allegheny. He also serves as the coordinator of the communications program. He's the author of One Less Car, Bicycling, and the Politics of Automobility. Uh, He is the editor of Punkademics and co-editor of the NFL Critical and Cultural Perspectives. Uh, Good morning, Zach. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. First things first, before we kind of get into the meat of the conversation, uh, Penn State, along with practically every other university, has gone to online instruction. Um, how is that going for you, for your the classes that you have been teaching? Um, it's It's been fine for me. I think I've talked to a lot of different people, both at my school and around the country that have been, that have, you know, were forced to make the adjustment pretty quickly. I, it's a little bit of a weird mix because it's technically uh, remote learning. So the just the drawing a line between that and online teaching seems kind of arbitrary, but I, one of the things I found out was that uh, you were, we're a little bit hampered as to how we can do things. We, we have to sort of keep the, the daily times and do things as if it's regular instruction because uh, remote learning doesn't impact the aid that students can get. So if you have too many online classes, it can negatively impact your student aid, which I didn't realize. Oh, Fun I facts, realized, yeah. Fun, fun facts, facts during the pandemic, but yeah, no, it's it's been it's been okay. I think it's it's fine on my end because, but I'm you know I'm technologically pretty savvy. Like I live in a you know my own house, and my students are kind of uh, you know they're in a lot of different circumstances. There's people that had to go back to states where they live that are in a different time zone. Other people have you know families that they're with constantly, or familial responsibilities, or people have to work and. You know, it's just it's a lot for students to juggle, I think. That's something that it's a topic for maybe a different conversation, but that's something that we have talked about on this program before has been digital, uh, the digital divide, so-called, that there are a lot of places once you get out of the urban centers and even in some cases in the urban centers in Western Pennsylvania that do not have good Internet connections. And I know that's been a challenge for some of the public school districts sending students home. It's one thing to send them home with a, a tablet or a notebook or whatever, uh, electronic, to, to do lessons. But if they can't – I saw a story recently about students, I think it was in West Virginia somewhere, who were gathering in the parking lot of a McDonald's to do their online work because it was the only place in town that had a decent Wi-Fi connection. I for saw them. a similar thing about uh, Philadelphia. And yeah. it, was cu- it was coupled with an article that talked about – the the irony being that uh, Comcast, I think, believe is headquartered. Is he there. headquartered? Yeah, <laughs> it is in fact headquartered in Philadelphia. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, if if it's one of those things where everybody views the internet as a utility in its function, um, both personally and the way that jobs are run. I mean, you have to apply for jobs online. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody uses it that way, but unfortunately, it's not something that is treated like that in the way that it's you know, not just with boring policy stuff, but just in the kind of practical everybody having access to it, mom, which is unfortunate. Uh, Zach Furness is our guest this morning. He's Associate Professor of Communications at Penn State Greater Allegheny. He also serves as Program Coordinator for the Communications Program. Uh, Do you have a a website? You have a a university website, Zach Furness. It's it's just ZachFurness.com. It's pretty boring. It's just for, mainly for, you know, biographical, easy access stuff. The, 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 uh, the, The famous curse is, may you live in interesting times. Uh, we have been living in interesting times uh, for some time now, actually, uh, but particularly these last few months as the coronavirus pandemic has, has has swept the country and the world. Is this something that you've been discussing with your classes? And if so, how does it how do you incorporate it into the students you are working with? I haven't discussed the coronavirus very explicitly as far as it being kind of a 
subject for, you know, more than conversation. And I've really just been trying to check in with people to make sure they're doing okay and find out what's going on. It seems like the more questions I ask with students too, the more I can tell that people are having a little bit more difficulty than, than they're letting on. Um, and that's not to say that everybody is in that boat, but I've just been more concerned with their, their well-being and finding out how they're doing and trying to do what I can to help, you know, make the end of the semester run smoothly. And yeah, I, w- I was just um, wondering if there were I, that, that I think you have the right strategy. I was just wondering if there was any if there was any teachable moments about reading the media or understanding sort of this fire hose of information that is coming at us right now. Well, the last assignment I gave to my the students in my media and society class this semester, um, I, it's a sort of open ended creative project that they can do on pretty much anything related to media and the pandemic. So however they want to approach that, whether it's looking at, you know, online uses of memes or uh, news coverage or thinking about their own kind of personal relationship to the ways they engage with media since, you know, they've been basically quarantined at home or stuck between home and um, going to a job. So yeah, I've kind of kept it open-ended and I'll, I mean, I'll be interested to see, see what people do with it. Uh, describe a meme for me because that's a word that five or 10 years ago would not have been in the common lexicon. My wife asked me and, and she and I are both in our forties. Um, but she asked me uh, not that long ago, what is a meme? Am I pronouncing that right? A meme? Do I always get that word wrong? But this has become a way, it, it was certainly something that we saw in the presidential election in 2016 that uh, really kind of caught fire that the, the presidential candidates were using memes. Their supporters were using memes. What, what is, what is a meme for, for our uh, listeners who may be feeling left in the dust all of a sudden? Uh, I mean, memes are, memes are essentially, they're images, right? But they're, I don't know, I can't remember exactly when they started. My memory is mildly horrific. But the, uh, the, the term was one that, the term that one it, that came into use, uh, I believe in the 90s, and it was sort of in reference to uh, the way that images sort of circulate virally. And it sort of took the language of uh, thinking about, you know, genes and, and, and the way that, uh, you know, biological matter disperses. Um, and, and viruses sort of circulate quickly and, and memes were, were images that, that seem to float around and become popular and, and just kind of like end up spreading around places without anybody really knowing their origins or where they started. And in some ways it not being very important uh, who created them, they're just sort of out there, but they're usually, you know, they they range between just like kind of goofy, silly images. A lot of ones that are very, I don't know, as my Midwestern friends would say, like sort of insider baseball, mm-hmm. like, you know, inside sure. kind of j- inside jokes from people, you know, early internet culture, uh, people who are, who are online years before a lot of other people were. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of images and, and jokes and things that circulated between people that were kind of, you know, internet computer geek folks. And I use that term lovingly. It, um, it, but it's, it's, it's sort of a, 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 an image that is repeated over and over again. And sometimes it goes through iterations. So it's, you know, you've seen that same picture with that same caption, but then somebody, iterates that they put a little bit of an ironic spin on it and then the next person spins it a little bit more is it strictly an internet phenomenon because I'm, I'm thinking back and you know if you looked back to the 1940s there was the little man the kilroy was here that was drawn yeah. on all kinds of things in this late 60s you had peace signs and um the the ban the bomb symbol and and smiley faces in in the 1970s um those are sort of physical th- in the 3d space yeah, memes. It seems I mean, to me, you, but they wouldn't have been called that in 1968 or whatever. I mean, you've always had people making use of of images and symbols that can they can circulate and mass produce, and or ones that are just easy to copy and replicate. I mean, some of the something that street artists have always done. I mean, companies that have been smart about branding have have done that since the you know the 19th century. Um, I mean, there's there's all kinds of different ways that you could look at it, but I think memes specifically were started from getting circulated on message boards and you know kind of later were used in every kind of you know format we're familiar with nowadays social media facebook um on on youtube but more, maybe in you know links to, in the comment sections but mainly on any kind of like visual social media but i yeah in recent years they've been definitely used a lot for kind of political and and cultural and social war if you want to think about it that way as far as yeah. you know visually trying to you know circulate messages that have these kind of loaded signifiers in them so for you know some people get them right away some people don't and that's kind of like why people enjoy circulating them is because 
you know, for some groups, it makes it feel like it's, uh, you know, they're in on the joke. Um, but if increasingly, it seems like you, you get a lot of that with, there was a, there was definitely a lot of uh, memes circulating for very political reasons uh, before the last election, especially. Uh, Zach Furness is uh, associate professor of communications at Penn State University's Greater Allegheny Campus. He's the author of One Less Car, Bicycling and the Politics of Automobility. He's the editor of Punkademics, and he is co-editor of the NFL Critical and Cultural Perspectives. You can find out more at ZachFurness.com. Um, it seems to me that some of these memes were weaponized, and, it, and there was something that you said that I sort of keyed in on, which is, you know, if you're in the in-group, you know what the meme is supposed to be if you and you and you get the reference if you're not in the in group it's just a picture of a weird looking cartoon frog right right because we we saw in 2015 2016 and i think this has died down a little bit that the alt right as as it's called white supremacists and white nationalists had adopted this cartoon frog as a mascot and if you weren't in the know this frog popping up doing something just looked like a, a weird poorly drawn cartoon frog but if you yeah, were in the know it was like wait a minute when, when did frogs become racist yeah and then there's there's a lot of that sort of insider quote unquote joking kind of stuff that got circulated in places like 4chan and 8chan which were kind of throwback uh message board like communities online um believe both of them are, are no longer around right now. Um, but yeah, there was, there's tons of that that was circulating Pepe the Frog, lots of uh, different images of, of reproductions of people making the, the okay sign with their hands, which became appropriated as a, as a white nationalist, white power symbol. Um, and, you know, to, to the point where that was very widely known. And, you know, these things, we're not talking about insider joke as in a few people getting it. We're talking about, you know, Millions, Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, yeah. millions of people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's especially I think they I think that they can they do some interesting work as far as uh, pushing a political and often really terrible message um, while kind of going under the radar because it doesn't look outwardly offensive. Right. I mean, people would have more of a reaction to seeing like a, uh, you know, a naked body than they would seeing some coded racist cartoon frog right but it's not a swastika it's not a burning cross it's not a ku klux klan man in a hood which would be very obvious overt signs of a racist ideology it's this cartoon frog wearing a hat or this cartoon frog doing something or as you put it the okay symbol that yeah it's it's what you sh it's what you show and you can't show those things right yeah, okay. it's the same kind of way that uh the the, the phrase dog whistling uh, yeah. that, re that refers to you know, the way politicians, uh, racist Dixiecrats in the South, for example, um, you know, years ago would, would would use terms and talking about like inner city and urban, right? When what they meant was the black community, meant African-American folks. Um, and so you get a lot of that same kind of, you know, using using one term as a euphemism for another or as a way to kind of mask what it is that you actually want to say. But for the people who are attuned to it, the folks that you're actually trying to reach, they're they're well aware of what you're saying. Uh, we have to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about um, your students' experience in particular and, and, and what you have learned about they have grown up, most of them, digitally native, internet native. So there has been no learning curve. And then I kind of want to extrapolate that. And, and for our older listeners who uh, the internet is still more of a new thing to them, how their experiences may differ, okay? Sure. Zach Furness is Associate Professor of Communications at Penn State University's Greater Allegheny Campus. He's the author of One Less Car, Bicycling and the Politics of Automobility, editor of Punkademics, and co-editor of the NFL Critical and Cultural Perspectives. You're listening to Two Rivers 30 Minutes, broadcasting from the Tube City Center for Business and Innovation in downtown McKeesport. We'll be right back. Support for this broadcast comes from Strifler's Family Funeral Homes. Since 1866, Strifler's has provided compassionate professional memorial services for families in White Oak, McKeesport, Dravosburg, Portview, and the surrounding areas. Strifler's offers comprehensive pre-planning services and aftercare. And through its affiliated company, Design Monuments, Strifler's also provides permanent markers and memorials crafted in stone, bronze, and other high-quality materials. Learn more at strifler's.com or call 4 412-678-6191. I can remember going off to college and the internet or Usenet 
was what we had, which was text messaging. It was uh, sending emails. It was going into message uh, chat rooms, as, as they would later be known, but uh, message boards and, and reading text messages. If somebody sent you an image, it was a big deal because you had to download this image and, and decode it. And, and I can remember coming home from college and, and trying to explain to my grandmother what this was. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like you can talk to anyone that you want to who's on this system anywhere in the world about any topic you would want to talk about. And she kind of looked at me and she said, why would you want to do that? And that I mean, was a, 25 valid, years ago. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a valid question, I guess. <laughs> 25 years ago, and I have still have not come up with the answer to that. Um, y- your students, though, who I'm assuming are all 19, 20, 21 years old in that age range, your college age, most of them, uh, or what we would think of as traditional college age, th- they have not known a world without cell phones, without email, without surfing the web. Again, I can remember using a web browser for the first time. I think it was uh, Mosaic. Um, and it was like, oh, you can down, you know, I don't have to decode these pictures like I do on email. They just, pictures just show up on the window. Um, are, are your students better or worse equipped to sort fact from fiction on the internet? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things that I've noticed over the years, I think is, that's kind of funny is that because we hear so much about, you know, students, my age or not students, my age, but you know, the, the age of most of my students and, and just generally, you know, I've been teaching college since 99. So mm-hmm. even, even when I was barely older than the folks that I was teaching, but sure. you know, in the, especially in, I think in recent years, the fact that you do have so many people growing up as, you know, quote unquote, digital natives, um, their experience of the internet is, is really limited, <laughs> which is surprising. Um, they're, I mean, they're incredibly skillful at using social media, but I'd say that by and large, most people's experience of the internet is social media and then clicking on random links to and from places, which is not to say that's radically different than the way people used it before. But I think that the, I don't know, it's partly because it's, it's not to say that it was somehow people were, were different years ago when it came to the internet. But I think when it, when people first had the ability to, to sort of explore and check things out, there wasn't one centralized kind of place where you could go find things as your kind of portal to everything else, the way that, you know, Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or anything else works. So you, you know, it took some looking around and kind of exploring. And I think that there was, there was an interesting dimension to that where it did give you the kind of sense, I don't know, in the way that we talk, use geography metaphors to think about it or however you want to describe it as a landscape or as some uncharted map or you know whatever way you want to think about the kind of vastness of you know worldwide connected communication but there was there was a lot to see and and explore and I think that that kind of curiosity came along with that period in a way that I think might be different from a lot of people's experience now where they are just interested in in different kinds of things. They grew up with a completely different set of norms or ideas about what they want to use it for, why they want to use it. Um, but I think they're they're definitely way better equipped to to handle certainly to handle you know meeting with people or talking to folks and communicating with people online. I mean that's just second nature. Um, but I I do think that there's a the, ironically I, I think that just because you grow up in a digital environment doesn't necessarily mean that you're you know a great deal about either the internet itself or the kind of, you know, the, the things that it can do for you. But, you, you know, you could say that about a, a lot of different things. I mean, we have, you know, transportation vehicles that can take us lots of different places. It doesn't mean that people necessarily know how to, you know, how to fix a car or, you know, what three states away looks like because they've never driven there. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, there has been a lot of talk, the phrase fake news has become, uh, well, became a current thing in 2015, 2016. Uh, it has also, to jump back a few minutes to something we were talking about before, has become a little bit of a meme, uh, whereas, you know, anything that you disagree with, you can just call fake news now. But uh, we, we all obviously know where this comes from when President Trump was a candidate in 2015, 2016. That was kind of something that he threw at people. Um, my question for you is, how do we sort the fake news from the real news. Um, there are so many, you mentioned if you sort of click around random links, there are so many websites coming at people now, some of which, you know, you used to be able to tell the, the amateur ones from the legitimate ones, but they all kind of blur together now. So how, how do we critically read the sources that, that we're being confronted with? I mean, it's, it's difficult because, I mean, I think the best advice that I can offer is to point people to, 
you know, two news sources that I think are valuable ones. Um, there's no magic solution for, you know, giving people a set of instructions on, on how to, on, you know, on how to make sense of all that, because, you know, not everybody has the time interest, or it's even possible to know how some of these organizations work, you know, what the difference is between stuff that is news ish and things that are just kind of straight up, you know, uh, horse hockey is, is, yeah, (laughs) well, well, stuff that's all, but then things that are also more just kind of like PR and then other things that are just really, you know, just completely garbage kind of information that's designed to, you know, just be a kind of political weapon propaganda Um, in other words. Yeah. Just straight up propaganda. And I mean, it has, you know, people use different terms for it now, but that's exactly what it is. Um, Generally speaking, I mean, you know, during the, you know, you want to, you want to go to news, you want to go to places. If you're, if you're reading information online, you want to be able to know who wrote it, where this, where the source is that it's actually from a publication, especially if you're coming at things from, you know, Facebook. Uh, I mean, there's, there's good lists of publication. You want to stay away from things like, you know, the daily caller, um, you know, things that are organizations that are run by the kind of folks that spend four hours a day on mics like this, you know, on, <laughs> on, uh, you know, basically just talking like conspiracy theories okay. nonstop. Mm-hmm. If it's, an, if it's, if it's, if it's stories affiliated with people that do that, you, you probably don't want to be reading those. Um, you know, you news organizations that do their jobs responsibly and, and reporters work really hard in, in having to check facts and, you know, really doing committed work to to try to make journalism something that holds people in power accountable i mean it's you know on the regular like i i watch uh, and listen to democracy now mm-hmm. i read the washington post um i read articles from the philadelphia inquirer and uh you know occasionally from the new york times and uh, new york daily news uh there's a lot of independent media organizations that have long been doing you know fantastic work out there and by independent i mean you know non-corporate mm-hmm. and not necessarily funded by advertising. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's lots of good stuff out there and I'm more than happy to put up some information on, you know, uh, on websites and, um, or on, on your website, but I would advise people to really, to try to do their best to, to follow sources that are, that are long established. Um, I will really focus more on trying to read news than watching things by and large television news, television broadcast news. It's not designed to give you, the best amount of information it's designed to get ratings and it's designed um, and, to have pictures i mean it's designed for whatever yeah. is photogenic not necessarily is the information you need to know uh there, there when i was working in a print newsroom we used to watch the one of the tv stations out of johnstown and i won't mention which one it was but the, the joke was that their call letter stood for we're just automobile crashes because there was a lot of car crash it was a lot of car crashes and fires it was not a lot of hard-hitting news about what was going on in the city government or, you know, or my taxes going up or my taxes going down? Has there been uh, uh, turmoil? Is there questions about the curriculum at the school district? None of those things. It was basically what they could scrape off of the police scanner. Um, yeah, that's true. And I, and I think that, you know, that that's one of the reasons why I think that you should, you should take some of that stuff with a grain of salt. It's not that there aren't good journalists who work in, you know, TV or, uh, but it's, it's not designed the, the way that it's designed has much more of an influence on, how it looks than the the intentions of the reporters who work there. We're, we're coming into a, a political uh, season. Well, a, a, anymore, it seems like all year round is political season in, in the United States. It seems like it never really ends. But the advertising is going to ramp up. Uh, we're already seeing political ads for the November election. And as we're recording this, it's only April. How should people be processing this? Because it, it, it can be exhausting. Honestly, I joke with my wife that just watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy sometimes because it seems like they pack a lot of political advertising into those hours. Right. It could just be exhausting. Uh, as we get into this political season, what sorts of signs basically of propaganda should we be watching out for? I mean, they're kind of everywhere. It's difficult to again, it's kind of difficult to give people a, a, a recipe or just to tell people not to watch it um, because, you know, that's not a luxury that we necessarily we have. Necessarily just- have. Yeah, we, we can't just turn it off, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we see this kind of stuff everywhere. But I do think that most political messaging, I honestly would advise people to to, to, to ignore a lot of it as much as possible, um, or at least to try to, at the very least, supplement their engagement with, with those things from, from reading news and actually finding out what people's, you know, stances on policies are. Um, and these this isn't the kind of stuff that, you know, you have to go spend hours and hours and hours doing it. And people shouldn't have that individual responsibility to 
to have to do this. I mean, these are structural problems in the way that that media functions, that they allow mass media, that they allow a lot of this stuff to happen, especially like, you know, the policies of companies like Facebook, where they have absolutely no problem making money hand over fist, putting out stuff that they know is inaccurate, dangerous, uh, you know, really detrimental to healthy civic discourse, you know, what you're supposed to try to have in a democracy so people know what's going on and they can actually try to vote in in the interest based on you know being an informed citizen and that may sound i mean the fact that even sounds so like hunky dory and old fashioned now is kind of a testament to where we're at um because it seems like so much of our so much of the way that we understand anything about candidates now and 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 political events political happenings is through you know, is through this kind of lens of, of propaganda, of through these images that we see, this stuff that gets shot to us in, in little snippets on Facebook, these stories that get re- recommended to us, videos that pop up on YouTube, et cetera. I mean, I really think that the best thing that people can do is to try to to try to go to, you know, reliable, established news sources and to try to read some articles about people's policies um, to try to do their best to tune out some of the the noise that comes from social media. Use, you know, if you're on Facebook, use Facebook to get in touch with your friends, right? Use it to find out what your, you know, what your kid's dog is looks like these days, or, you know, use it for social purposes. Don't use it as a place where you're going to try to become an informed citizen about the world. Um, I think that that's one of the best things I could advise people to do is to to go find your news and the information you use to think about politics of the day outside of the same space where you know you see tons of you know pictures of 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 cats and dogs and updates about people's babies because that's the stuff that it's good for it's not good for giving us reliable accurate information to help us be informed citizens you you make it sound like it's the dessert bar at the buffet restaurant that like there's meat meat and potatoes and vegetables yeah i mean dessert has some value to it at least i mean there's not (laughs) you know i mean I wouldn't call it dessert. It's more just like the... It's, it's, just, it's completely it's a, empty it's, calories. It's a something bar. I mean, there's something there for, for you to check out. But I think especially when it comes to Facebook, you know, there's there's a real danger in that being the the one place where people kind of go to for their entire experience of the internet, where they socialize, where they communicate with people, where they read news, where they watch funny stuff. I'm certainly not the... I would recommend a, you know, a, a book called uh, Anti-Social Media that came out recently about Facebook. Um, that I think is excellent and talks about some of this as well. But Facebook does have the ability to kind of jumble all those aspects of our life together. And that's one of the arguments made in the book. And I think it's correct where it's important to disentangle some of that stuff. So, you know, use Facebook for keeping in touch with people, checking out pictures, being social, but, you know, go find your information elsewhere. Most of the stories that are the, the most prominent, highly rated, most popular ones that circulate on there are from extreme right wing uh, sources. And we're, I'm not talking extreme and like partisan Republican. I'm talking stuff that 20, 25 years ago would have been seen as, as you know, quasi fascist would have been right? mimeographed and somebody passing it out to you. Uh, it would have been the stuff that got circulated by by white supremacists and yeah. Nazis, quite yeah. literally. And I mean, that stuff has been it's become mainstream now. And and Facebook is one of the places that has allowed that to happen. Zach Furness is Associate Professor of Communications at Penn State University's Greater Allegheny Campus. Uh, This semester, he's been teaching the Media and Society class. He's the author of One Less Car, Bicycling and the Politics of Automobility, editor of Punkademics, and co-editor of the NFL Critical and Cultural Perspectives. He joined us, uh, like everybody else is these days, uh, remotely from his home. Thank you, Zach, for taking some time to talk with us this morning. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening today to Two Rivers 30 Minutes, broadcasting from the Tube City Center for Business and Innovation in downtown McKeesport. You've been listening to Two Rivers 30 Minutes, copyright Tube City Community Media Incorporated. Opinions expressed on this program are not those of Tube City Community Media Incorporated. Listener support makes this program possible. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible contribution, please visit our website at tubecityonline.com and click on the donate link. You can also get a free subscription to this program and other podcasts at our website using Apple's iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you've got a question or comment, we hope you'll write to us. Our address is Tube City Community Media Incorporated, P.O. Box 94, the Keysport, PA, 15134. You can email us at TubeCityTiger at gmail.com or call us at area code 412-614-9659. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at TubeCityOnline. Online.